Hi, I'm Frankie Mazapika. I hope you enjoy the video that you're about to see. It's our desire that at the conclusion of this video, you will have a heightened expectation of the plan of God for and your the life. The title of the message is Returning from Drifting. Returning from Drifting. Uh, I'm going to talk about a guy in the Bible. His name is David. And if you want to start turning there in your Bibles now, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 12 is where we're going to be studying. Um, and if you want to just have the notes of my message, dial this, uh, type in Celebration Church TW on your app. And all of my notes are inside of that app. You can follow along with me. You can email it to yourself. But we're going to be studying about a guy named David. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating because in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, God looked at David and said, that right there, he is a man after my own heart. The way David was living his life, he goes, this is a man after my own heart. He promoted him as king over all of Israel. It was, this was his man. And the Lord was excited about it because the king before him, he was just a very sinful, evil person. So the Lord was really excited about this. David was nervous, but he ended up being a phenomenal king. However, he started to drift about halfway through his reign. What do I mean by that? As a boy, he would sit in the field and he would pluck a harp and he would worship the Lord. Some of you can remember being a child, being a young person in church, just worshiping God. This was David. Just, the Bible says that he was, uh, he he was good-looking, but he was a ruddy boy. He had just wild curls. He was just a ruddy kid that spent time in the field watching sheep, and he would just worship God with a harp. He'd just worship. Nobody was around. He didn't care. He just worshiped the Lord. Have you ever done that? Uh, have you ever just worship God when you're by yourself? Worship God in the car. This is what he would do all the time. Just worshiped God, completely devoted. But at some point, at some point, all of a sudden, his worship began to go on the side. It, it was on the side burner. He began to tell himself uh, new theology. Not theology in scripture, his own theology. Things like, well, I just believe that I don't have to worship every single day. I just believe I don't have to go to the temple all the time. I mean, God knows my heart. God is everywhere. I don't, I don't have to do the things that I used to do to the same extreme. It's okay. This is a personal theology. You, you can't find it in Scripture anywhere at all. It, it's, this, Jesus used to say, I love when they gather together. In Psalms 23, verse 8, even David said, he goes, I love the sanctuary of God because it's where his glorious presence dwells. Yes, God is everywhere. That's the omnipresence of God. He's everywhere. But there are certain places on the earth where he says, my people will meet me here. Whether it's a tent or a tabernacle or a church, the sanctuary of God is where God meets with his people. Can you put your hands together for that? That's the sanctuary of God. But there was a moment in his life where he just started drifting. And uh, there was a particular sin that he committed that indicates how far he had drifted. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, and then I'm going to just share a little bit of verse 9. It reads like this. So the Lord sent Nathan to go to David and tell him this story. There were... Two men in a particular town. One was rich, and one was poor. The rich man owned much cattle and flock, uh, herds and cattle. He, he owned a lot. But the poor man, he only owned a little lamb that he had bought. He loved that lamb. He 
raised the lamb and it grew with his children. He held the lamb in his arms and it ate off of his own plate. It drank out of his own cup and he cradled it. He cuddled it like a baby girl. One day, a guest showed up to the rich man's house. And instead of killing his own animal from his flock or from his herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it, sacrificed it, and served it to his guests. And David, when he heard this, the Bible says that he was furious. And he said this, as surely as the Lord lives, I vow any man who has done any such thing should die. They should give back four lambs for the one lamb they stole because they had no pity. And Nathan, the prophet, looks at David and he says, you are that man. No doubt. If you let me take a sidebar, how he stepped back, shocked that anybody would ever speak to him that way. Nathan says, you are that man. And then he says this, it was you who murdered Uriah the Hittite by the sword of the Ammonites. He set up Uriah, put him on the front lines to make sure that he would be killed. He arranged for that murder. And then you stole his wife. You are that man. And the Lord, and he says this, he goes on after that, after the ninth verse, he goes on to say all the ways that the Lord is going to punish him for what he's done. See, at some point, he went from this young man to this worshiper, this, this one to just say, God, I devote my life to you. My, I'm not just giving you, Lord, I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe in you. I can't wait to see you in heaven. It, no, 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 no. It was the Lord of his life. How can I serve you? I live to serve you. I live to worship you. You are my Lord, my Savior to all all of a sudden drifting so far that murder and adultery is something he could easily do. It was as if his heart had been seared with a hot iron. And so I'm going to share with you three things, three verses, three verses that came from his journal that he penned immediately after Nathan rebuked him. He felt bad. He felt sorrowful. He felt guilty. He was embarrassed in front of the Lord, but he wanted to be back in relationship, but he didn't know how to do it. And so he journaled his thoughts in Psalms 51. There were 19 thoughts, 19 verses. I'm going to pull out three. But I don't know how uh, it, all of a sudden, but yet I do. Uh, how his life went from having boundaries to seemingly having no boundaries. That everything is okay. Just as a commercial time out, uh, I was in the truck uh, yesterday with my son Luke. And he said, you know... I, I, I wish Yamaha, the company Yamaha, would consolidate all of their products into one building to where someone can walk into a building and say, I would like to buy a Yamaha piano. And they would say, it's right this way. And then someone else could come in and say, I would like to buy a Yamaha guitar. They would say, well, it's right this way. And someone else could walk in. I would like to buy a Yamaha boat. They could say, right this way. Someone else could walk in and say, I want to buy a Yamaha motorcycle. Okay, right this way. I want to buy, there's, is there anything that Yamaha doesn't make? I want to make a Yamaha, I would like a Yamaha lawnmower. 
It's like there's nothing. They, they, they make everything. They're, they're, they started off saying there's one product we want to make, and now they make anything. I got an idea. Let's make a toaster oven. Let's do it. <laughs> I want to make a refrigerator. Well, whatever. Go ahead and do it. You need some How much do you need? Anyone else have any ideas? This is how Yamaha lives. It's just anything and everything. And this type of lifestyle causes a very, very quick slide, a very, very brisk drift. So I want to unpack three thoughts that he wrote in his journal. The first one is in Psalms 51, verse 3. He says this, I recognize my rebellion. I think about it every day and every night. When a person's heart is not completely seared, when a heart is completely seared, they don't feel guilty anymore. They don't feel bad anymore. They have a new theology. They believe that some way, somehow, they're going to be in heaven because everyone goes to heaven. It's fascinating because the scripture says, choose the narrow gate. Choose the narrow gate. And it talks about how the broad gate leads to destruction. We got that inverted. We think that the broad gate leads to everlasting life and the narrow gate leads to hell. No, 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 no. It, it's the narrow gate. It's, it's the narrow gate. And not a lot of people go through that gate. It's the narrow gate. The Bible says that it is a hard path. It's not a wide gate that you go, ah, I'm getting, look where I'm at. That doesn't happen. And he's, he's saying this, I recognize my rebellion. I can see where I'm at. And if that's you today, you're in a beautiful spot. Because there's so many people that have taken an entry drug. You know, an entry drug. It's, it, they're drugs that... that someone takes before they get into hard drugs. They call them soft drugs, like, um, like cigarettes or alcohol or uh, prescription medicine. They're soft drugs. You don't feel guilty typically about it. And you just kind of stay there. But then what ends up happening is, is that the soft drug all of a sudden becomes a crutch that you cannot live without. And oftentimes, this goes from soft to hard. Now it's a prescription. I heard this one time that people with hardly a little bit of money, they get their drugs off the street. But people with a lot of money, they get their drugs from a prescription. <sighs> this just got awkward. All right, let's go back over here. I have a friend of mine who has a teenage daughter, and she said, Daddy, you're addicted to wine. And he said back, and it's true. He goes, Jesus made wine. Wine is not a sin, which is true. She goes, yes, but you can't live without it. You're addicted. So my friend said, you know, you, <laughs> you can imagine. I am not addicted. I can put this down anytime I want. So she said, well, do it for one month, and let's see how that goes. Let's see if you can go one month. I can do one month. That's easy. Six hours later, he's staring at the bottle. The next day, he's just mad at his daughter. The day after that, he's mad at everybody. By the next day, he's mad at himself because now he's wondering if it's true. Just mad for 30 days. <laughs> at the end of 30 days, he made up for the 30 days. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't think so. At least he didn't tell me. When it's something you have to have, all of a sudden the most important thing is when you back up and you say, I recognize this. Do you know every single step towards sin is, a, is an invitation to the next step? Your flesh will never be full of sin. It's the moment you begin to sin, you will want to sin more. There's nothing in your life, there's nothing in your life that's a temptation from hell. Once you take the temptation, there's another temptation. Once you take that temptation, there's a... Your flesh will crave sin. 
It craves sin. Well, what sin? You know in here. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16, it says, I will write my laws on your mind and place them in your heart. I don't need to stand up here and make a list of the sins. The Lord has placed it in your mind and placed it in your heart. You know when the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 no. Are you with me? Say yes. Just clap your hands if you've ever felt the Holy Spirit saying, no, 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 no. The second point that I want to say is, so the first thing in verse 3, 15, um, um, Psalms 51, verse 3, he says, I recognize it. Very, very important. But remember, the second one I want to say is verse 10, where he says, create in me a pure heart. I can't do this anymore. Have you ever been there? I, I've talked to so many people, so many people in the hallway in the foyer of the church where they say, I don't even want to ask God to forgive me anymore because I know I'm going to do it again. I know I'm going to do it again. I know I'm going to say it again. I know I'm going to do it again. I know I'm going to stop doing it again. I know me. I've been doing this my whole life. I'm not going to change. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. It's the reality. You can't do it. Wouldn't it be nice? Like in your car, if you say, I want to love Jesus more, be more committed, and just turn up the volume. And like, wow, that was easy. I love. Wouldn't that be nice just to turn up the volume? But we can't do it. We will sleep right through everything that has to do with God. There's no passion. You put your hand on your pulse, it's not there. Put your hand on your pulse, not there. Not there. Not there. There's no, it's just not there. I'm sorry, Frankie, I want to love God. I wish I could love God like you, but you know what? It's just not there. Sorry. What are you going to do? Send me to hell? It's a, a scary place to be. And this is where David was. He's like, you saw what I just did. I'm gone. Help me. Help me. Create in me. You're going to have to take your hand and shove it in my chest and pull out my heart and put a new heart in. And if you don't do that, I'm going to keep on being the way I am. You're going to have to create in me. Create, just take it out and start over. Have you ever been there? You're going to have to just start over. I need a mirror. You're just going to have to start over. That is a wonderful, wonderful place to be. And then he says this in verse 17, Psalms 51, 17. This is the last point I'm going to share out of his journal. He says this. He goes, he says, he says, the sacrifice, and it's almost like the, and he was, the Holy Spirit just breathed into him and said, David, 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 David. He just committed murder, just committed adultery. The Lord just chastised him. And so now he said, what do I have to do to come back? I've recognized what I've done wrong. I need you to create a new heart in me. What do I have to do? What do I have to do to be back? To that little girl who used to squeeze her fists in the air because she had so much passion for God. What do I have to do to be the young man that I've never been? Where I'm excited to be in the presence of God. What do I have to do? Tell me what to say and I'll say it. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. What do I got to do? And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just breathed right into his soul. And he took his stick his, 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 and dipped it in ink. And he wrote, verse 17. The sacrifice I desire is a broken spirit. For I will not reject a broken and a, for, a, a an apologetic heart. I will not. He's saying to David, I've seen all you've done. 
I've seen it all. I've seen what you did when the lights were out and the door was shut. I've seen it. I've heard what you said. I've watched you blow your head. I've watched you mess up every, we had so much momentum. We had so much going good and you do this. All I want is a repentant heart. That's it. That's all I want is a repentant heart. I want you to recognize it. I want you to ask me to create a pure heart because you can't do it by yourself. You know how the Lord knows that you can't do it by yourself? The Lord knows you can't do it by yourself, but we think we can do it by ourselves. We're just going to be more holy. I'm going to be more righteous. I'm going to be more holy. And the Lord says this. This is a great verse. It's in Psalms 103, 103 verse 14. He says, I remember how you were made. I know that you were made from dust. He's looking, I remember. I remember that you were made from dust. I, I remember that your entire body came from dirt. With love, I say this, you're a dirt bag. <laughs> You're, you're a dirt bag. You, you got a beautiful heart, a beautiful soul, a beautiful spirit. But this whole thing is just a bucket of dirt. It's a, yeah, I got a jar of dirt. I got a jar of dirt. <laughs> this is how much he loves you. I want to close with this story of this young man who got healed recently because what he had to go through we went through he had Lyme disease for a long time long time several years when I heard his story it just broke my heart because the Lyme disease got so bad that he couldn't get up and take a few steps now, I'm not going to tell you the rest of his healing. I'm not going to tell you the rest of the miracle because he's going to say it himself on the video. But how many of us, maybe it's not Lyme disease. When he had Lyme disease, he couldn't even get a few steps in without having to sit down. How many of us wake up in the morning and before we're even out of bed, we go, oh, Again, <laughs> we got to do this again. And you can hardly put two steps in front of each other. You can hardly get through what you're going through. The Bible says this in Matthew chapter 11, verse, I think it's 28. He says, you. You, come to me. Come to me. Those of you who are exhausted, you're exhausted. Come to me. If there's one thing that you hear me say this morning, if this is the only thing that you remember this morning, you came to church this morning to worship him, you came to church this morning to, to stand in his presence, you came to church this morning to hear a word from God, this is the word for you. Come to him if you are weary. Come to him. I'm begging you. I'm bad. Don't clap. I'm sorry. Don't clap. I'm begging you. Because if you don't go to him, you will stay in the state that you are. Best case scenario. The most likely scenario, you go down a very slow spiral. And you're a walking corpse. You got your nails did. You got your hair did. And you're wearing Revlon. 
but on the inside, you're a walking corpse. And the guys in the room are just saying, this is my life. Just get used to it. No. This is not the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to come to him and say, if you still do miracles, do one now. If you like that video, take a second and click the subscribe button as well as the notification bell. This way you'll always know every time we've uploaded a new video.